During the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the world of cinema was ruled by one genre, westerns. The hit formula that mixed open deserts and starry skies with mind-boggling gunfighting sequences and a hero that epitomized courage and in some cases even recklessness worked every single time. And John Wayne was the king of this genre. His deep voice combined with his brooding looks made him the ideal Western hero. For many, many decades, Wayne was the symbol of American freedom. Through films like Red River, True Grit, and The Searchers, Wayne not only exhibited his acting range, but also became etched in our memories as the man who defined the American Western protagonist. So it's not surprising that when we think of Westerns, cowboys, and gunslingers today, we think mostly of John Wayne. In this video, we'll tell you some interesting facts about the star and also shed light on his ugly side. He wanted to be a professional football player. John Wayne was born Marion Robert Morrison to Clyde Leonard Morrison and Mary Alberta Brown on May 26, 1907 in Winterset, Iowa. When he was seven years old, the family moved to California. As a child, Wayne's best friend was a dog named Duke. The two were almost never seen without each other. Due to this love for his dog, Wayne soon came to be known as Duke. Wayne had a towering personality since the beginning, which made him a natural athlete. Wayne went to college at the University of Southern California on a football scholarship and majored in pre-law. He was an active member of Trojan Knights and Sigma Chi. At the time, it seemed that Wayne had a successful sports career in front of him. However, he suffered a body surfing accident, which led to a terrible collarbone injury. After the incident, not only did all of Wayne's football dreams come to an end, but his scholarship was also taken away, and he dropped out of university. This was during the Great Depression, and Wayne was desperate for money. He took up a job as the prop guy for Fox Film Corporation. His injury may have quashed his football dreams, but he eventually got to play a football player in Brown of Harvard and Dropkick. His struggle lasted over a decade. Like any other successful actor, Wayne too had to go through his days of struggling. It was director John Ford who discovered Wayne's acting talent and offered him a small role in the 1928 silent film Mother McCree. During the shooting of the film, Wayne became close friends with Ford. It was Ford who introduced Wayne to Raoul Walsh, who gave Wayne his first big break in The Big Trail. The film was a mediocre hit and did not establish Wayne as a star. However, it certainly made him a well-recognized face. Throughout the 1930s, Wayne kept waiting for his big break. Unfortunately, it didn't come. The decade mostly saw him starring in low-budget Western movies. Though Wayne wasn't getting the roles he wanted, he used the decade to his best advantage, devoting himself to studying the quintessential Western hero. It was during the 30s that Wayne developed the idiosyncratic walk that would eventually make him so famous. He also learned to do his own stunts. Wayne got his big break at the end of the decade. In 1939, Ford offered him the role of the Ringo Kid in Stagecoach, and the film changed his career. And all the work he'd been putting in finally paid off. Red River established him as a major movie star. Wayne enjoyed significant popularity during the early 40s. However, the film that established him as a major movie star came in 1948. Directed by Robert Hawks, Red River was a massive hit. The film narrated the story of Tom Dunson, played by John Wayne, and his son Matt Garth, played by Montgomery Cliff. Many believe the film had strong homosexual undertones. However, this was the 40s, and if the film had any hidden messages, they went unnoticed. Red River, however, was a major critical and commercial success, and went on to win two Academy Awards. In 2008, the American Film Institute ranked Red River as the fifth greatest Western of all time. With Red River, Wayne impressed many people, and one of these people was his old friend John Ford. And the quiet man changed his image. After watching Wayne play Tom Dunson in Red River, Ford cast him in the 1952 film The Quiet Man, a film that was quite different from everything both Ford and Wayne had done in the past. In this romantic comedy, Wayne played the role of Sean Thornton, an ex-boxer who goes back to Ireland to purchase his family farm. Audiences were used to seeing Wayne firing shots in deserted streets and open deserts. The Quiet Man did the opposite. It transported Wayne to a green and beautiful Ireland, and audiences were happily surprised. Moreover, it made him fall in love with the belle Mary Kate Danahar, played by Maureen O'Hara. The film was a hit, grossing $3.8 million at the box office. It won John Ford an Oscar for Best Director. Though the film did not win Wayne an Oscar, it certainly played a key role in changing his image. After The Quiet Man, Wayne got many opportunities to explore his acting range further with varied roles. John Wayne was a major movie star and people loved him. However, he was imperfect in his own ways. Did you know the man was often criticized for his far-right beliefs and he was even accused of racism? We'll get to John Wayne's ugly side in a minute. 
In the meantime, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Wayne delivered perfect entertainment in Rio Bravo. Wayne played the lead in the 1959 western Rio Bravo, a film that not only achieved commercial success, but was also selected for the National Film Register due to its cultural, historical, and aesthetic significance. The actor portrayed the character of John T. Chance, the sheriff of the Texan town Rio Bravo, who arrests a murderer and fends off the bad guy to ensure justice is served. Rio Bravo was a fun film in an understated way. As a viewer, you wouldn't have gushed over it once the end credits rolled, but you were bound to enjoy it while it lasted. Outside the US, Rio Bravo got mixed reviews. The story of Rio Bravo was taken from a short story by the same name, credited to a B.H. McCampbell. The story played a big role in the film's success, as one of the best parts about the production was the plot, which featured a band of misfits who gave way for abundant comedy. Later, in the biography Howard Hawks, The Silver Fox of Hollywood, we find out B. H. McCampbell was none other than Hawks' eldest daughter, Barbara. The Searchers features Wayne's best performance to date. Another masterpiece from the two-decade-long Ford and Wayne partnership that produced more than 25 films was the 1956 Technicolor western The Searchers. Widely acclaimed as the best western of all time, The Searchers is a rare film that was a critical and commercial success in its era, and continues to be regarded as one of the greatest films ever made, almost 70 years later. In The Searchers, Wayne delivered what can arguably be labeled as his acting career's best performance. He played Ethan Edwards, a veteran who returned home after eight long years only to witness the murder of his brother's family, and subsequently rescue a niece who is abducted. On a deeper level, the movie focuses on white settlers' racist attitudes towards the native settlers, and themes of abduction, captivity, and rape that white women were subjected to. Warner Brothers distributed The Searchers, and in what was a first at the time, the production house produced and broadcast a behind-the-scenes program. The movie inspired several films over the later decades. In fact, the 2016 Canadian drama Searchers is partially based on it without the racism aspect. True Grit won him an Oscar, finally. After most of Wayne's golden years as an actor were behind him, his skill was finally recognized with an Oscar. The 1969 Western True Grit brought home the Oscar for Wayne, who played the role of Texan U.S. Marshal Rooster Coburn. The movie is a namesake of the 1968 novel by Charles Portis. True Grit features Wayne as a tough-as-nails, one-eyed veteran who's killed more than five dozen men in eight years, but all in the line of duty or self-defense. The character was so well-received, Wayne was made to reprise it in the 1975 sequel, Rooster Coburn. Wayne even received a Golden Globe for his performance in True Grit, but of course the award was overshadowed by the long-awaited Oscar. His political beliefs and racist comments got him into trouble. Wayne was a far-right supporter all the way, which was difficult at the time since Hollywood was flooded with far leftists. The actor, who was always at odds with other board members at the Screen Actors Guild, decided to change the way things were and co-founded the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals to push back against the leftist movement at the time. Wayne also played a part in the blacklist of communists in Hollywood. While Wayne's political opinions raised questions, his racist remarks tarnished his image the most. In an interview, Wayne acknowledged the dissent in the black community, saying it was justified. Still, he backtracked by saying he believed in white supremacy till the day blacks were educated and deemed fit to assume authority. Not only did his comments spell trouble then, they recently stirred anger when they resurfaced, with many demanding the Orange County's John Wayne Airport be renamed. Some of John Wayne's personal and political beliefs and comments got him into trouble, but the man was a cinematic legend. His countless epic performances as the original protagonist in Hollywood to embody courage and heroism made him a star. Wayne's skill at his craft was extraordinary, and he managed to win hearts with box office successes as late as in his 70s. Wayne passed away from stomach cancer in 1979 at the UCLA Medical Center, leaving behind millions of fans with a legacy like none other. John Wayne. John Wayne, real name Marion Robert Morrison, was born in Iowa, but moved to California where the warmer climate would be better for his father's health. John was a promising football player and secured a place at USC to study law and also play football. Unfortunately for the team, John broke his collarbone body surfing and had to give up his football career. The silent film star Tom Mix regularly attended USC football games and, as a favor to the coach, hired John as an extra and prop boy. Director John Ford used John for bit parts in a range of early movies. John was 18 at the time, and his career was to span more than 50 years of filmmaking. John was tall and with an athletic physique. It was this that caught director Raoul Walsh's eye. 
he cast John in his first leading role in The Big Trail, which was released in 1930. Walsh and Fox Studios head honcho Winfield Sheehan met and decided on a new name for John. They felt he needed a professional name that was snappy and uncomplicated, and chose John Wayne. The man himself was not even there when his name was decided. The Big Trail was the first film of its kind in the sound era and cost more than $2 million. Commercially, it was a flop, but it had set the standard and today is considered a classic. It also introduced John Wayne as a Western actor. He followed this with nearly 10 years of appearing in low-budget Westerns, generally referred to as horse operas or Poverty Row Westerns. John himself reckoned he had appeared in over 80 of these types of films. He became a household name after co-starring in Stagecoach with Claire Trevor. This film was released in 1939 and was an enormous success. The critics loved it because of its high production standards, and the accountants loved it because it made a large profit. One of John Wayne's biggest regrets was that he was unable to enlist in the U.S. Army during World War II. His draft was deferred several times due to Republic pictures opposing it. He was under contract to Republic and was the only A-list actor on their books. He was able to tour U.S. bases in the South Pacific and did some undercover work for the Office of Strategic Services, later known as the CIA. He did credit his patriotism in later life to the guilt he felt for not being able to play a bigger part in the war effort. In the post-war years, John began to choose roles he wished to play, often making his choice on patriotic or moral grounds. He refused the lead in All the King's Men because he thought it promoted un-American sympathies. He also refused a role in The Gunfighter because he felt he had been treated badly in the past by Harry Cohn, Columbia's boss. Gregory Peck was handed the role. Over the next 20 years, John Wayne appeared in more than 20 John Ford-directed films. One of these was The Searchers, which many believed to be John's best film, and the role that showed his scope as an actor. Over his career, Best Actor Oscar success eluded John. He had a nomination in 1949 for The Sands of Iwo Jima, and then won the Oscar in 1969 for The Alamo. In 1976, John appeared in what was to be his last film role, the western The Shootist. He developed stomach cancer and died from it in 79. While he divided critics during his long career, John was considered by many to be a master of his craft. Clint Eastwood Born in 1930 in California, Clint Eastwood had a privileged childhood as he came from a fairly well-to-do family. He was no academic, partly because he was having too good a time away from school in his teens. He was sometimes in trouble for pranks and left school possibly without graduating. He held a variety of jobs as a teen, including paperboy, golf caddy, and lifeguard. At 21, he was drafted into the Army during the Korean War, but served out his time in Fort Ord, California. At one point, he begged a lift on a Douglas AD bomber that was returning to base from Seattle. The plane ran out of fuel and crashed into the ocean, and Clint and the pilot had a two-mile swim back to shore. While at Fort Ord, Clint was put in touch with director Arthur Lubin, who auditioned him on behalf of the Universal International Film Company. There followed a number of years where he only managed to get minor roles on TV and low-budget films. His big break came in 1958, when he was cast in the TV series Rawhide as Rowdy Yates. Rawhide ran from 1959 to 1965 and established Clint as a household name. He found the role of Rowdy, who was a real goody-goody character, rather limiting. He jumped at the chance to act in A Fistful of Dollars when it was offered. This was the first of Sergio Leone's spaghetti westerns, in which Clint created the character of The Man With No Name. He played the same character in For A Few Dollars More and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Initially released in Italy, then the rest of Europe, the films were not released in the U.S. until 1967. The critics were disparaging in their reviews of the films. Today, they're considered classics, but for many critics, they were too far removed from the run-of-the-mill westerns they were used to reviewing. In 1968, Clint starred in Hang 'em High, a revenge western which did gain the approval of the critics. He followed this success with a number of non-western films like Coogan's Bluff and Where Eagles Dare, before taking the lead in Dirty Harry, which is probably his most iconic role. Clint's career continued with a mix of westerns and non-westerns, including Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, The Outlaw Josie Wales, and four more Dirty Harry films. In 1992, Unforgiven was released, which was directed by Clint. It garnered nine Oscar nominations and won four. Clint took Best Director, and the film took Best Picture. Another critical success was The Bridges of Madison County in 1995, alongside Meryl Streep. 
In 2003, Mystic River, which Clint directed, earned two Oscars and a nomination for Clint as Best Director. 2004 brought more success with Million Dollar Baby, which he also directed. It won four Oscars, including Best Director and Best Picture. Clint, at 74, became the oldest director with two Oscars for Best Director. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And stay tuned to hear about the beef between John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. Why John Wayne and Clint Eastwood Never Acted Together Both men are classed as Hollywood megastars. Both are closely linked with westerns, although they both acted in thrillers, action movies, and romantic films too. So why do the two greats not see eye to eye? It's been suggested that John Wayne felt threatened by Eastwood. Clint represented a changing landscape in westerns. John felt secure in the types of roles he was playing, and when the spaghetti westerns came along, it marked a major departure from that style. Wayne actually turned down the opportunity to play Dirty Harry. At one point it seemed John Wayne was just behind the curve and struggling to catch the new mood in Hollywood. In response to Dirty Harry, he made McHugh, and in response to Coogan's Bluff, he made Brannigan. Neither was particularly successful. Maybe this attempt at copying Clint's successful films was a sign he was jealous of the younger actor. In 1973, Clint wrote to John and offered him a role in High Plains Drifter. Wayne rejected the offer, as he felt the film did not represent the American West as it had really been. Later, Clint suggested the rejection came because John was making a different Western with Don Siegel at the time. In High Plains Drifter, Wayne saw an attempt to degrade both the American West and the Western movie. He just couldn't accept that the kind of behavior represented in the film would have occurred in the real Old West. In 1973, when Clint was preparing to film The Hostiles with Larry Cohn, he felt it would be a good idea to ask John to play one of the leads. John said no, although he didn't give a reason. Clint even went to the length of changing studios in an attempt to get John to change his mind, but no luck. John just replied with a critique of Clint's earlier films. This was the nearest they ever got to starring in the same movie. John Wayne knew Clint Eastwood would likely become the greater star. He was not one to wish the upstart well, but resented his success. Eastwood certainly eclipsed Wayne as a director, although much of his success came after Wayne's death in 1979. John Wayne held right-wing political views. He also expressed racist views and tried to justify the grabbing of Indian land in the 19th century. He was a staunch Republican. Clint, on the other hand, held more mainstream views. He supported both Republican and Democrat candidates based on their personal qualities. He also held public office from 1986 to 88 as mayor of Carmel, California. It seems John Wayne and Clint Eastwood's rivalry was mostly because of Wayne disliking Eastwood's approach to the Old West in his movies. Wayne clearly resented the rise of Eastwood as a star and was perhaps jealous. John Wayne's High Praise of Ron Howard While John Wayne often portrayed tough and rugged loners on screen, in real life he was a big softy. He loved his family, and this included those he unofficially adopted into it, including the Happy Days actor, Ron Howard. The two met during production of the 1976 western The Shootist. Howard played Gillum Rogers and left quite the impression on the legendary Hollywood star. John Wayne starred in the production as J.B. Books, a sheriff turned gunslinger. Unfortunately, their real-life friendship blossomed at a time of declining health for Wayne. Because of this, their time knowing one another was short-lived. Wayne offered much praise for the young star, the rising star who made a strong impression. Ron Howard left a strong and positive impression on John Wayne. Wayne described him as a young fella who he thought was as good an actor as he'd ever worked with. His description continued by labeling Howard as just wonderful. But their very first encounter wasn't so ideal. When first seeing Howard, Wayne gave a witty response due to seeing the young actor holding a magazine that featured a spread for Happy Days. In classic John Wayne fashion, he dryly said, A big shot, huh? But Howard managed to get the Hollywood legend on his side by asking Wayne to read lines with him. This was a pleasant surprise for Wayne, as nobody ever asked him to read lines with them. It was enough to win him over, while Howard didn't need any excuse to like Wayne as he was already a huge fan. Howard explained he'd always admired John Wayne as a movie star, but also thought of him as a total naturalist. Respect mutually grew between the two actors, and Wayne gave possibly the highest praise any up-and-coming actor could hope for. He explained he'd have been proud to have Ron Howard as his son. He continued by saying he'd be even prouder if he was Howard's agent, and that he was his brother. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like, and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. And stick around for more details about the relationship of John Wayne and Ron Howard. What John Wayne Taught Ron Howard About Manhood 
Today, Howard is mainly known as one of Hollywood's most prestigious film directors, with works like Apollo 13, A Beautiful Mind, Frost Nixon, and Solo, A Star Wars Story, it's easy to see why. But Howard is also known for another successful career in Hollywood as an actor. He had prominent roles in The Andy Griffith Show and Happy Days, and is also well known for his role in George Lucas's American Graffiti. His appearance in The Shootist happened to be John Wayne's final movie. It also starred other Hollywood greats like James Stewart, Lauren Bacall, and John Carradine. With the cast of such Hollywood greats, it lends credence to Ron Howard's appearance in the film as a passing of the torch from one generation to the next. Howard explains John Wayne used a phrase for scenes that were going to be difficult. That phrase, which he later attributed to film director John Ford, was, quote, This is a job of work. Howard went on to explain if there was a common thread between Wayne, James Stewart, and Glenn Ford, it was their work ethic. To cheat the project to them was an insult. To cheat the audience was damnable. The Final Days of John Wayne Sadly, John Wayne passed away three years after the impactful meeting between himself and Ron Howard. He was undoubtedly the most popular and beloved movie star of his generation. But further than that, John has become an American icon, who ranks up there at the top alongside George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Davy Crockett. With a life well lived, Wayne's 70-year-old body was quickly breaking down. The filming of The Shootist was precarious, due to Wayne's poor health. He was having so much trouble breathing there was an oxygen tank available on the set for him to use. He suffered bad coughing spells, and there were several days of shooting he missed. This led to a use of a double to keep production moving. Suffering great pain led to Wayne being moody, angry, and sometimes hostile. It's been told that one day during the shoot, Wayne blew up at the cameraman, accusing him of not filming correctly and not paying enough attention to the lighting. The director of the film, Don Siegel, angrily told Wayne to leave the cameraman alone. He told Wayne to take a look at the dailies, the footage from the previous day. Wayne did as requested and watched them. Needless to say, he was pleasantly surprised. Wayne then described it as, quote, the best damn film of him he's ever seen and asked for forgiveness. Wayne's high praise didn't help The Shootist on its release. The movie was a massive flop that grossed less than $6 million domestically. While Wayne wasn't broke, he was in need of money. This led him to star in TV commercials, which was something the legend had never done before. He filmed commercials for an aspirin substitute, Daytril, as well as Great Western Savings and Loan. Bad investments on his part had cost him a fortune. This left him bitter, knowing he deserved to be much more well-off after all of his years in Hollywood. This wasn't helped by his heart troubles. A lifetime of heavy smoking, drinking, and eating less than healthy foods were taking their toll. Wayne had to undergo a heart operation and had a pig's valve put on his heart. John Wayne made his final public appearance at the 1979 Academy Awards. He'd gone through radiation treatments earlier that day, having been diagnosed with cancer. His weakened state was noticeable. Taking a short rehearsal, he then took a nap, feeling very sick and tired. He appeared that night and awarded the Best Picture Oscar to Coming Home, which starred Jane Fonda and John Voight. After leaving the stage, Wayne was greeted by his good friend, singer-actor Sammy Davis Jr. Davis gave Wayne a big bear hug, which he regretted later due to Wayne's physically fragile state. Considering Davis was about 125 pounds and worried about hugging John Wayne, it goes to show how poorly Wayne's health must have been. It's even been revealed he was so frail-looking he beefed up his appearance by wearing a wetsuit under his tuxedo. It wasn't long after this final appearance that Wayne collapsed on the floor in agony. His health rapidly deteriorated as the cancer spread. He went into the hospital and absolutely hated it. It's reported Wayne broke down and cried sometimes while sitting in his painful confinement. With his health fading fast, family and friends visited to pay their respects. Surrounded by several family members, on June 11, 1979, Wayne passed away. John's First Wife When John was 19, he went on a date with a girl named Carmen Saints. While the date reportedly went fine, it had a very surprising twist ending. Wayne met Carmen's sister Josephine at some point in the evening and realized he was more interested in her than Carmen so he began dating Josephine instead. They were considered an odd match at the time because he was 19 and was from a family with not a lot of money, whereas she was only 16 and came from family money. But they didn't let that stop them, and they got married on June 24, 1933. The marriage lasted around seven years without many issues, but in 1940, things changed. Josephine discovered John was having an affair with actress Marlene Dietrich. He was filming a movie with Marlene at the time, and the two had begun a relationship on set. Josephine was heartbroken, yet wanted to give the marriage a second chance. She sought counseling from a priest she knew, and he provided some help. But this turned out to be not enough, and the couple eventually separated and got a divorce. John's Second Wife 
John and Josephine's divorce was finalized December 26, 1945. And if John was upset about the divorce, he certainly had a hard time showing it because he married another woman in less than a month. After meeting and falling for a woman named Esperanza Bauer, John married her three weeks later. Esperanza went by the nickname Chata, and Wayne and Chata got married at the Unity Presbyterian Church of Long Beach. This was notable because it's the same church where Wayne's mother got remarried. Ward Bond, a fellow actor, served as John's best man. And despite the fact that it was a quick turnaround from his previous marriage, Wayne was excited to have fallen in love again, at least at first. Things between John and Chata went sour pretty steadily. After going on a honeymoon, the pair returned to L.A. and bought a house in Van Nuys. On Chata's insistence, they set up an extra bedroom for her mother to live in. This caused a rift. As one can imagine, it was likely pretty difficult to build a brand new marriage with someone else living in the household. Chata shared with John that she had an interest in joining him in the acting business. She wanted to start auditioning for movies and hoped John would help her. But John had other ideas. He preferred she not have a career at all and instead stay at home and be a homemaker. As such, she grew resentful and quickly developed a drinking problem. Reportedly, Wayne grew more frustrated with the situation and confided to Ward Bond that he was sick of Chata's mother not only living with them, but constantly speaking only Spanish. He said that not only that, Chata and her mom would commonly take up their marital bed, forcing John to sleep on a living room couch. At one point, Wayne likened their marriage to a science experiment gone wrong. The two finally divorced in 1954. Chata told her side of the story to the media after the divorce, referring to Wayne as abusive and addicted to alcohol. Wayne denied these accusations. Sadly, Chata didn't live too much longer, passing away in 1961 from a heart attack. John's Third Wife The trials and tribulations of his marriages to both Josephine and Chata were not enough to discourage John from the institution itself. In fact, just as he'd done before, Wayne wasted no time after his second divorce before falling in love and marrying yet another woman. He met Pilar Paulette and married her in late 1954, while the ink on his divorce to Chata was still drying. But apparently, their marriage was a happy one to begin with, and didn't suffer from the relative immediate tumult that his first two marriages had. John was diagnosed with late-stage lung cancer in 1964. Sadly, he had to have his left lung removed, as well as four of his ribs. This illness no doubt put a strain on their marriage, though they managed to stick it out through John's illness and subsequent recovery. However, by the time the 1970s rolled around, the two were having issues. As he'd done with Chata, John reacted by devoting more and more time to his work and being on set rather than being home. By 1973, the pair were officially separated. John and his children John had a complex and often tumultuous relationship with his children. Throughout his life, he had a total of seven children from three different marriages and various relationships. While he was admired for his on-screen presence and his larger-than-life persona, his role as a father was marked by both moments of closeness and periods of distance. Wayne's first marriage to Josephine produced four children, Michael, Mary Antonia, Patrick, and Melinda. He didn't have additional children with Chata, though that seems reasonable given how quickly that marriage fell apart. But he got started back up with Pilar and had three kids with her, Aisa, John Ethan, and Marissa. John's relationship with his seven kids suffered from the tumult of his various marriages and divorces and also from his schedule as an actor. He often found himself on location for long stretches of time and couldn't be there to help raise them. And at the same time, he made efforts to continue to show love and support to his kids as best he could. Overall, his relationship with his children was a mix of love, support, and at times, distance. Despite the ups and downs, Wayne's children have continued to honor their father's legacy. Many of them have pursued careers in the entertainment industry, with some finding success in acting and other creative endeavors. John's Will According to the Associated Press, John's estate at the time of his death was valued at about $6.85 million. This was split up into $100,000 in income, as well as $5.75 million of personal property. Plus, he had $1 million in real estate property. John had an odd system for deciding how much money each of his kids got. In his will, he stipulated that they each got $5,000 multiplied by the number of years old they were when John passed, minus 21 years. For example, Michael Wayne, who was John's oldest, was 44 when John died. 
So 44 minus 21 is 23, giving Michael 23 times $5,000 or $155,000. He also took care of his first wife, who received monthly payments of $3,000. Chato is no longer around, so she wasn't in the will. Wayne also left some money to his longtime assistant, Mary St. John. She received $10,000, and he gave thirty dollars to his assistant, Pat Stacy, with whom he'd allegedly had an affair. One interesting note is that while John's oldest daughter, Ronnie, was part of the will, there was a separate section that expressly prohibited her husband, Don LaCava, from getting any money. It even went on to say he wasn't allowed to collect Tony's share of the money after she died, but it was never explained why there was so much animosity between the two. So the big question that many people have is, why was Pilar excluded from the will? Well, for starters, they had a fairly acrimonious ending to their marriage. John had been getting sick again in the early 70s, which is right when she decided to separate from him. So he was forced to go it alone as his health deteriorated. And despite his rough and rugged exterior and persona, he was still just a man struggling to stay healthy. So he likely felt some resentment. Oddly enough, though, the two never got divorced. She continued to wear her engagement ring John got her long after his death, and yet he felt she shouldn't be included. This is no doubt in part of the animosity, but Wayne's lawyer said it also was because the two had a separation agreement years before his death that likely included some monetary exchange. So it's likely that while Pilar wasn't in the will and didn't inherit any of his estate, she had been paid at least some money in the separation. Catherine Hepburn the first John Wayne hating celebrity we'll take a look at is Katherine Hepburn. She had such a distaste for John Wayne, she actually turned down the opportunity to work with him on one occasion. But she went back on her word later in life and worked with John in a picture shortly before his 1979 death. Though Catherine criticized the star's behavior on set, it seemed she had grown to respect him by the time of his passing. It should not come as a shock to viewers that John Wayne was one of the biggest figures in Hollywood during the industry's golden age, who was willing to work with the American government to help expose his communist peers. He had strong ties to the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, which was the group that hunted down communists in the entertainment industry. HUAC was the organization responsible for getting communist stars blacklisted during Hollywood's golden age, and Wayne's involvement with the heinous organization caught the ire of many of his peers in the industry. One of those was Katherine Hepburn. In the early 50s, Hepburn was given the chance to star alongside John Wayne in the movie Hondo. John wanted Katherine to play the lead female role alongside him, but she turned it down because she felt the work he was doing with Huack was monstrous. The role went to Geraldine Page, and even she went on to receive an Academy Award nomination for it. Two decades later, the political climate in Hollywood had calmed down considerably. The House on american Activities Committee was a thing of the past, and stars were not encouraged to go to war with each other just because of differing political beliefs. In the 70s, Catherine changed her mind and decided she'd be willing to star alongside John Wayne if only for one movie. That was 1975's Rooster Cogburn. Although Catherine had warmed up to John enough to star in the picture, she had some decidedly negative remarks to share about him after filming. She apparently had some criticisms about how much John got into arguments with the crew of the film, feeling it was unprofessional. But she changed her tune by the time of John's death a few years later. Upon his passing, she admitted he was a talented man. John Lennon the late John Lennon was another celebrity who had some decidedly nasty words about John Wayne. Both during John's life and after his death, it seems John Lennon had no respect for his fellow celebrity John. The way John Lennon saw it, he was a seller of peace while Wayne was a seller of war. This put the two at direct odds with each other. Lennon claimed Wayne had been trying to sell him war since the popular musician was a little boy, as Lennon grew up watching John Wayne's films. When it came time for Lennon to raise his own children, he made sure they had no exposure to the warmongering works of John Wayne. Many of Lennon's disparaging remarks came from a 1969 interview that he gave around the time of his most flagrant anti-war activism. Around the same time, Lennon and spouse Yoko Ono locked themselves in their bedroom to protest the Vietnam War, John Lennon could be heard saying in this interview that he had no interest in letting his and Yoko's son, Sean, watch John Wayne's films. Years later, after John Wayne's passing, Lennon still continued to ridicule the late Hollywood legend. By that point, Lennon felt the only thing that worshipping a Hollywood figure like John Wayne could bring to someone was death. Lennon also went on to insinuate the reason Wayne succumbed to cancer was because the actor wasn't in touch with his feminine side. According to Lennon, John Wayne's feminine side turned against him and destroyed him. 
Of course, John Lennon sadly died an even more tragic death right after John Wayne's. Before we tell you more, be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Spike Lee An example of a more modern celebrity who has spoken out against the legacy of John Wayne is famous filmmaker Spike Lee. Lee let his hatred for the late John Wayne be known to the public during a 2018 BAFTA event. At the event, Spike Lee gave a long lecture about the way different races have been portrayed in Hollywood films. It didn't take long for him to get to the subject of John Wayne's westerns and how many of them depicted Native Americans as savages. Spike didn't mince his words when criticizing John Wayne, and most of the crowd certainly agreed. Spike also criticized John Ford, who was the director of many of the John Wayne pictures he was talking about. While many of Wayne's peers hated him around the time the Western legend was alive, Spike Lee's hatred for the Western star's legacy is more emblematic of modern society's views on the movie star's works as a whole. Thanks in no small part to outspoken people like Spike Lee, modern society has been re-evaluating the legacy John Wayne left behind. Many feel John was a racist and misogynist who shouldn't be revered posthumously despite his film work. One can imagine Spike Lee certainly sides with them. One can imagine Spike Lee certainly sides with people who don't want to celebrate a racist or misogynist, such as those campaigning in vain to have the Western legend's name removed from John Wayne Airport. Clark Gable Clark Gable and John Wayne actually agreed on most political issues. Both John and Clark were rare Hollywood Republicans, though this didn't necessarily mean they were friends. In fact, it seems Clark wasn't all that fond of John Wayne. But their feud stemmed from artistic differences, not political ones. After years of starring in classic films, John decided towards the later 1950s he was ready to direct his own. His directorial debut ended up being the classic 1960 film The Alamo. Though it's considered a classic by many today, there were plenty of people in the entertainment industry who felt the Western legend was overreaching in his attempts to become a director. One such person was Clark Gable, who thought John would fall flat on his face. That's why Clark refused when John offered the chance of the film's lead. Wayne allegedly begged Clark Gable to take on the lead role of Davy Crockett, but Gable refused. He was one of the most respected actors in the industry at the time and had no interest in risking his credibility to do John a favor. John hadn't intended on starring in the Alamo, but ended up taking on the role of Davy Crockett himself. Critics are still divided to this day whether John's directorial debut is cheap, warmongering propaganda or an actual classic film. Frank Sinatra the final John Wayne hating celebrity we'll take a look at is Frank Sinatra. Frank was so liberal during his early days in Hollywood that the FBI was spying on him to make sure he wasn't a communist. Frank was a liberal activist of the time, supporting numerous liberal organizations and politicians. Meanwhile, John Wayne was quite the opposite. It stands to reason the two would have butted heads during their shared time in the industry. Things came to a head when Wayne criticized Sinatra's hiring of a director with communist ties. John Wayne wasn't the only figure who criticized Frank's hiring of blacklisted communist filmmaker Alfred Maltz to write a screenplay for one of his films. The backlash was so universal, Frank ended up letting the filmmaker go. But he never let go of his grudge against John Wayne. The two reportedly nearly got into a physical altercation at a Hollywood benefit show, though this incident somehow caused the two to squash the beef and become friends. It seems that both Frank and John won the other's respect during this near altercation, and the two remained friends from that point forward. John Wayne's Private and Political Views Wayne was a lifelong conservative and member of the Republican Party. He was especially opposed to the spread of far-left ideologies and communism. While he would typically vote for right-wing candidates, he did vote for the Democrat Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1936 election and expressed support for Roosevelt's immediate successor, Harry Truman. Wayne later supported Richard Nixon in the 1960 presidential election, but when JFK won the vote, he patriotically expressed that even though he didn't vote for him, he wished him well in his presidency. In that controversial 1971 Playboy interview, Wayne voiced spirited support for the Vietnam War in addition to making those polarizing and offensive statements on race relations. He said that he, quote, believed in white supremacy until the blacks are educated to a point of responsibility. Wayne went on to elaborate his point by sharing he didn't believe in giving authority and positions of leadership to what he labeled as irresponsible people. He later expanded upon these views, saying he didn't believe America did anything wrong by taking the lands of the Native Americans. Ron Howard took Wayne's advice. 
1976, Wayne and Howard appeared alongside each other in the Duke's final film, The Shootist. The film was released just three years prior to John's death in 1976. Reflecting on his experience working alongside Wayne, Ron Howard said his most powerful bit of acting advice came from him. Wayne's words of wisdom for the young up-and-coming actor and filmmaker were fairly straightforward. He told Howard to talk low, talk slow, and not say too much. John Wayne intimidated Dennis Hopper with a gun. Dennis joined John on the set of True Grit, the only movie to ever earn the Duke an Oscar. Hopper hailed from a different generation of Tinseltown stars. The same year True Grit hit theaters, he made his mark with his appearance in Easy Rider. Looking back at his time working with the iconic film star, Hopper recalled the day he showed up to the set of True Grit, Wayne was asking crew members where that pinko Hopper was hiding. While searching for his co-star, Wayne reportedly was walking around set with a gun on his hip. But Hopper didn't think he was actually out to off him. Rather, he believes Wayne simply wanted to have a political discussion with him. Fortunately, nothing ever came of that incident, and Hopper went on to live another day unscathed. Kirk Douglas didn't think John Wayne was a particularly great actor. This film legend lived a long and prolific life, dying at age 103 in 2020. Throughout his film career, he was fortunate enough to have worked with Wayne on several films, including Harm's Way, Cast a Giant Shadow, and The War Wagon. Although the two stars had excellent on-screen chemistry, they often clashed over political matters, seeing as Douglas held very liberal views and was a Democrat. But despite their differences, Douglas still held his colleague in high regard and understood what made him the star he was. Douglas said the thing that made John Wayne such a distinguished star was that he always played himself. Kirk didn't think Wayne was a particularly great actor, but he had charisma, was likable, and had undeniable star power. Douglas was quoted as saying that it wasn't Wayne who served the roles, it was the roles that served him. Anne Margaret refused to call Wayne the Duke. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Anne Margaret appeared in some of the most iconic films of the 60s and 70s. Only once, however, did she share the screen with John Wayne. That was the 1973 western The Train Robbers, which failed to become a commercial hit. But it has garnered somewhat of a cult following since its release. John Wayne's nickname was, of course, The Duke. It was a moniker he went by since childhood and one that almost everyone in his orbit used endearingly. Anne Margaret, however, couldn't bring herself to utter it. In 2014, she spoke to Interview Magazine. During that discussion, she finally revealed why she refused to call Wayne by that title. She said it was her upbringing that kept her from using the nickname. When she first arrived in the States after her family relocated from Sweden, Anne Margaret and her mother didn't speak a lick of English. When learning American formalities, she was taught that when you make someone's acquaintance, you were expected to refer to them as either Mr., Miss, or Mrs., and then stand up and curtsy. So, simply put, she couldn't bring herself to call Wayne the Duke merely because of ingrained social norms. Wayne's Feud with Catherine Hepburn Paul Caslow, John Wayne's co-star in the 1975 film Rooster Cogburn, recently revealed a few juicy details about the Duke's storied and often strained relationship with legendary actress Catherine Hepburn. Speaking to the outlet A Word on Westerns, Coslow said the two icons of the silver screen were frequently at odds with each other. He revealed one of the key reasons for their disagreements was their conflicting political beliefs. Hepburn was a Democrat, while Wayne was a diehard Republican. Beyond that, Hepburn especially clashed with Wayne over his unwavering support for the House Un-American Activities Committee's role in what was an anti-leftist witch hunt. In the process of outing alleged communists, a great many Hollywood actors and filmmakers were blacklisted, essentially having their careers obliterated. At one point, Catherine Hepburn grew so tired of Wayne's perspective, she refused to work with him. She later changed her mind, appearing opposite John in Rooster Cogburn, but even years later, Hepburn still presented Wayne in a pretty dismal light. During filming, Hepburn recalled Wayne would often get into heated arguments with the cast and crew. At one point, he even screamed at director Stuart Miller for having him repeat a shot more times than he felt necessary. After the movie finished, Catherine approached Wayne at the rap party and told him off, saying she was glad she didn't know him when he still had two lungs, because he must have been a real bastard back then. Coslow spoke further on his memories of Wayne when he shared a story about the time he first met the star on the sequel to True Grit. He said his first impression of Wayne was less than flattering. When introducing himself, Coslow said he was playing the character Luke the Duke. With a sour look on his face, Wayne snapped back saying, No, you're not. You're playing Luke the Puke, because there could only be one Duke around here. Needless to say, the two didn't become close friends. But they still managed to set their differences aside long enough to finish the film. 
Maureen O'Hara had nothing but glowing things to say. O'Hara and Wayne appeared alongside each other in some of the Duke's most beloved films, including Rio Grande, McClintock, and The Quiet Man. When later asked what her thoughts were on her former co-star, O'Hara says she wished all actors could be more like Wayne. She went on to express she wished more people could be as honest and genuine as he was, and she said he was a real man. Charlton Heston didn't think Wayne was right for period roles. Film buffs know Wayne and Heston appeared together in the 1965 biblical epic The Greatest Story Ever Told. In that film, Heston portrayed John the Baptist while Wayne was given a comparatively minor cameo. Heston was once quoted as saying, while there are actors who excel in period roles, others can't pull it off. He put Wayne in the category of those who couldn't perform well in such roles, saying, God knows he couldn't play a first century Roman. James Arness his clout was instrumental in shaping the careers of many of his contemporaries, one of whom was James Arness. Arness, a relative newcomer in the 1950s, found himself sharing screen space with Wayne in films like Big Jim McLean, Hondo, and Island in the Sky. Wayne, known for his generosity, even had Arness star in the Western flick Gun the Man Down for his production company Batjack. But Wayne's support for Arness wasn't confined to films. Recognizing Arness's talent, he recommended him for the lead role in the TV series Gunsmoke as Matt Dillon. This role became Arness's signature, and he starred in the series for an impressive 20 years. But despite their professional camaraderie, the personal relationship between the two took a hit when Arness snubbed Wayne during a crucial time. In a bid to fill the role of Sam Houston in The Alamo, he reached out to his old friend Arness. But Arness, who was busy with Gunsmoke, failed to show up for the scheduled meeting. John Wayne was deeply hurt by this perceived slight, and it's said he never truly forgave Arness for it. Wayne eventually cast Richard Boone in the role, and the Alamo went on to become a significant milestone of his career. But the incident with Arness left a bitter taste for John Wayne. It's speculated his disappointment was aggravated by his personal and financial investment in the film. Having put his own resources on the line, Wayne probably expected his friend to extend similar support. Clark Gable The root of the feud between Wayne and Gable can be traced back to 1953, during the production of John Ford's romantic adventure Mogambo. Gable was cast alongside Ava Gardner and Grace Kelly, while Ford, a notoriously ill-tempered director, took the helm. He was known for his method of pushing his cast to their limits to extract the best performances from them. This often involved making humiliating remarks about them, a tactic he employed with Gable during the African production of Mogambo. Ford's comments on Gable's age and weathered appearance were so harsh that Gable even walked off the set in protest. The feud between Ford and Gable escalated to the point where they stopped speaking to each other, marking the end of their professional relationship. John Wayne's loyalty to his longtime collaborator and friend, John Ford, led him to take a stand in the dispute. In Wayne's mind, any act of disloyalty to allies or support for their enemies was strictly forbidden. Consequently, Wayne felt compelled to defend Ford against Gable. Wayne's daughter, Aisa, shared more insight into her father's views in her book, John Wayne, My Father. According to her, Wayne's code demanded that he stand by his old friend Ford. This loyalty led to Wayne making some derogatory comments about Gable. Unlike Gable, who identified as a thespian, Wayne saw himself more as a star than an actor. He believed in the power of sincerity and simplicity in acting. According to him, the audience could identify with characters who reacted logically to their situations. Gene Hackman John Wayne had a surprising rivalry with esteemed actor Gene Hackman as narrated by Wayne's daughter, Aisa. While Wayne's relationship with Ford was productive, Aisa revealed that Wayne had a surprising rivalry with Hackman. In her 1991 book, she quoted Wayne harshly criticizing Hackman's performances. Wayne had once called Hackman the worst actor in town. He's awful, leaving the reasons for his harsh critique unclear. Despite Wayne's critique, Hackman's career flourished, and he later won two Academy Awards for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor for The French Connection and Unforgiven, respectively. Aisa speculated that if Wayne had lived to witness more of Hackman's work, he might have changed his opinion. Clint Eastwood 
The Western genre has always been a cornerstone of Hollywood, and two names that stand out in this realm are John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. While both are revered as iconic figures, they represent different generations and styles within the genre. Interestingly, these differences sparked a notable disagreement between the two, particularly over Eastwood's 1973 film High Plains Drifter. Eastwood's rise to stardom was meteoric. His second directorial effort, High Plains Drifter, was released at the peak of his popularity. It was critically acclaimed and showcased Eastwood as a mysterious stranger persuaded by a town to defend them against a trio of crooks. The film further solidified Eastwood's status as a respected figure in the Western genre. John Wayne was not a fan of High Plains Drifter. He felt the film didn't truly depict the pioneers of the West. This was a moment where Wayne, from his established position, criticized a young artist making his mark in Hollywood. The film revolves around Eastwood as a gunslinging drifter who enters Lago and faces resistance. Recognizing his talent, the inhabitants enlist his help against a band of hooligans terrorizing the town. The drifter agrees, but with a hidden agenda of his own. The disagreement between Wayne and Eastwood highlighted their artistic differences. As Eastwood began to find his directorial niche, Wayne leaned on his cowboy image, adding a comparatively bloated end of his career to the resume. Frank Sinatra Two iconic figures of Hollywood's golden age are renowned for their stellar performances and contributions to the film industry, but their off-screen relationship was marked by stark political differences, leading to a bitter feud that almost resulted in a physical altercation. Sinatra was an assertive advocate for numerous causes in the 40s, including initiatives against racism and fascism, as well as supporting internationalist causes. He was a proud member of the Independent Citizens Committee of the Arts, Sciences, and Professions, a group of influential figures that lobbied for progressive causes like free speech, racial equality, and disarmament post-World War II. Given the tense atmosphere during the Red Scare, Sinatra's liberal beliefs drew the FBI's attention. They compiled a dossier on the singer focused not only on his alleged mob connections, but also his left-leaning political beliefs. Wayne, on the other hand, was a prominent conservative figure in Hollywood. He was an enthusiastic member of the John Birch Society, a right-wing group known for its staunch anti-communism stance. Wayne also supported the House Un-American Activities Committee, a governmental body that scrutinized Sinatra's political activities. The political differences between the two came to a head in the 60s. Sinatra's decision to collaborate with Alfred Maltz, a blacklisted communist filmmaker, for the screenplay of The Execution of Private Slovak, irked Wayne. Sinatra's previous work with Maltz, a short film called The House I Live In, that promoted tolerance and condemned anti-Semitism, further fueled Wayne's discontent. When a reporter asked Wayne for his opinion on the collaboration, he indirectly referred to John F. Kennedy, a friend of Sinatra's, whom Wayne accused of being overly influenced by Sinatra. The tension escalated when the two attended the same Hollywood benefit. When Wayne took the microphone, Sinatra left the stage, leading to a heated exchange between the two. Eyewitness accounts suggest that the argument almost boiled over into a physical confrontation. Wayne, however, denied these allegations, insisting there was no trouble, and expressing his admiration for Sinatra's contribution to the evening's entertainment. An icon of Hollywood's golden age. Originally named Marion Michael Morrison, but known around the world as John Wayne, the American actor and filmmaker became a popular icon through his starring roles in films made during Hollywood's Golden Age. In particular, when someone thinks of a Western or war movie, John Wayne will no doubt come to mind. His career spanned from the silent era of the 20s through the American New Wave. Wayne appeared in an astonishing total of 179 film and TV productions. He was even among the top box office draws for three decades and appeared with many other important Hollywood stars of his era. Wayne played leading roles in numerous B-movies during the 30s, most of them westerns, but he hadn't quite become a major name yet. That all changed with John Ford's 1939 movie Stagecoach, where Wayne starred alongside Claire Trevor and Andy Devine. The western classic made Wayne a mainstream star. Wayne starred in 14 of Ford's productions a celebrated collaboration unlike any other in Hollywood history. Wayne played a wide range of roles in westerns that included a cattleman in Red River, a Civil War veteran in The Searchers, a troubled rancher in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, and a cantankerous one-eyed marshal in True Grit. 
His performance in True Grit earned Wayne an Academy Award for Best Actor. His final screen performance was that of an aging gunfighter battling cancer in the 1976 movie The Shootist. John Wayne made his last public appearance at the Academy Awards ceremony on April 9, 1979, before succumbing to stomach cancer later that year. He was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor of the United States. In 1999, the American Film Institute selected John Wayne as one of the greatest male stars of classic American cinema. John Wayne's Poor Financial Investments While Wayne is one of the most recognizable names in all of Hollywood history, he suffered from poor financial investments, which damaged his financial stability significantly. Those weren't just made by Wayne, but also his manager. The Hollywood legend spoke out about his financial troubles during an interview in 1962. He explained how after 25 years in his career, he was suddenly starting out all over again. He described how he didn't have it made at all, and while his business manager didn't do anything illegal, they were both involved in many unfortunate money-losing deals. At the time of the interview, if he sold everything he had, he would just about break even. One of his poor moments in judgment was betting on himself as a film director. A passion project of his was a movie based on the Battle of the Alamo. Wayne was old school, and he wanted to put all his money where his mouth was. So he did just that. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to Facts First for more. The True Life Story Behind John Wayne's Passion Project The Battle of the Alamo, which took place between February 23rd to March 6, 1836, was a pivotal event in the Texas Revolution. After a brutal 13-day siege, Mexican troops under President General Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna reclaimed the Alamo Mission near San Antonio, Texas. Most of the Texans and Tejanos inside were killed. Santa Anna's cruelty during the battle inspired many Texans and Tejanos. Driven by a desire for revenge, the Texans defeated the Mexican army at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21, 1836. This effectively ended the rebellion. Several months before, Texans had driven all the Mexican troops out of Mexican Texas. About a hundred Texans were then garrisoned at the Alamo. The Texan force grew slightly with the arrival of reinforcements led by eventual Alamo co-commanders James Bowie and William B. Travis. On February 23rd, approximately 1,500 Mexicans marched into San Antonio as the first step in a campaign to retake Texas. John Wayne's Cursed Passion Project John Wayne first got the idea for a film about the historic Last Stand, and he spent over a decade trying to get it made. But studio after studio in Hollywood turned the project down, reminding Wayne he was an actor, not a director. United Artists finally agreed to let Wayne direct the film, but this was only if he signed a three-picture deal and also starred in the movie. The Alamo was a historic moment perfect for a movie adaptation, and John Wayne was the man to make it happen, or so he thought. Wayne invested a hefty sum of $1.2 million into the film. Several of his friends also invested. The production of the Alamo felt like a curse of biblical proportions. Not only was Wayne directing a logistically challenging and high-pressure movie, but it was his first big production as director. As director, Wayne struggled to manage the film, which he also had to star in. The production suffered setback after setback, including a heavy rainstorm that delayed filming early in production. It deposited some 29 inches of rain. From there, the set garnered a reputation for wild rattlesnakes and scorpions. But the challenges didn't end there. Wayne initially wanted to shoot the project for cheap, which is why he originally planned to film in Mexico. But a group of Texas businessmen threatened to boycott the film if Wayne didn't shoot it in Texas. Wayne finally agreed, even though it would cost him a good chunk of his own money. The actor also had to deal with his mentor and director John Ford, notorious for being strict, and trying to take over while on set. The publicity office caught fire, which destroyed all the necessary paperwork for the film. A couple of crew members were killed in a car wreck, and then 80% of the cast caught the flu from an outbreak that spread during production. An actor even smashed his foot with a cannon. But most dramatic of all, there was a murder at the heart of the production. An extra named Legene Etheridge was murdered by her boyfriend while the two of them were working on the film. This led Wayne to having to shoot the film around a police investigation into the murder. While it took an enormous amount of hard work on Wayne's part, he managed to produce a classic that's remembered today. The film ended up being a hit with audiences. Apparently, Wayne needed to make $18 million to turn a profit, but fortunately for him, the film ended up making $20 million. This must have come as a huge relief for the actor and director, 
not just because of the disastrous production, but the financial woes he was trying to overcome. Maureen and John John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara are two of Hollywood's most iconic figures, and their off-screen and on-screen camaraderie has been well-documented. The duo, known for their dynamic chemistry, acted in several films together and maintained a deep friendship that lasted until Wayne's death in 1979. Their on-screen partnership began in the 1940s, and they quickly became one of Hollywood's favorite on-screen couples. Some of the most notable films they starred in together include Rio Grande in 1950. This was the first time they worked together under the direction of John Ford. The Quiet Man, 1952. Perhaps their most beloved collaboration, this romantic comedy set in Ireland, again directed by Ford, showcased their chemistry to the fullest. McClintock, 1963. A comedic western that displayed their impeccable on-screen rapport. Big Jake, 1971. One of their later collaborations set in the early 20th century. Their off-screen bond was just as deep. They shared mutual respect and admiration, evident in their interactions during interviews and public appearances. O'Hara often mentioned that she considered Wayne one of her best friends. They supported each other during good times and bad, and their families were also closely knit. Maureen once remarked, He was the big brother I never had. I loved him and he loved me. We were the greatest of friends. The Wayne O'Hara collaboration represents one of the most enduring and endearing in Hollywood history. Their films are often noted not just for the storylines, but for the very palpable chemistry and genuine fondness they shared. Even today, their films remain popular, a testament to the timeless nature of their on-screen magic. When John Wayne passed away in 1979, Maureen O'Hara was devastated by the loss of her dear friend. In fact, O'Hara's grandson, Connor Bo Fitzsimmons, told Closer Weekly that it was the only time he ever saw O'Hara cry. Connor said, quote, She didn't really cry when her husband died, but when Duke died, she cried. Their friendship stands as a testament to the kind of enduring bonds that can be formed in the often fickle world of Hollywood. O'Hara continued to honor Wayne's memory throughout her own life, always speaking of him with great affection and admiration until her own passing in 2015. Was there a romance? John and Maureen were two of Hollywood's most charismatic stars, and it's not entirely surprising that rumors swirled regarding a potential off-screen romance. Their collaborations in movies like The Quiet Man showcased an undeniable spark, which led many to speculate about the nature of the relationship. But both Wayne and O'Hara consistently denied any romantic involvement. They often emphasized the platonic, sibling-like bond they shared. It's also worth noting that both Wayne and O'Hara had their own separate personal lives and relationships outside of their work together. Hollywood has a long history of sparking romance rumors when two stars have good on-screen chemistry, often as a part of the film or the natural result of public fascination. In the case of Wayne and O'Hara, their repeated collaborations and evident fondness for each other made them prime candidates for such rumors. But in that same interview with Closer Weekly, O'Hara's grandson Connor told a different story. According to him, the two did in fact have at least some version of a romance. He said in the interview, quote, I know they did at one point, but she was way too strong for him. He added, they would never have been a good couple. So clearly at least one member of O'Hara's family is willing to concede that there was at least something of a romance between the two legendary stars. Though in fairness, it seems unlikely this was something Connor witnessed himself, so it could also be a rumor he believed as well. Maureen's Career Highlights Maureen was dubbed the Queen of Technicolor due to her radiant beauty and frequent appearances in color films. She was one of the most celebrated actresses of Hollywood's golden age. Born in Dublin in 1920, she had a film career that spanned almost six decades. Here are some of the highlights from their career. Her breakthrough role in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Maureen's role as Esmeralda opposite Charles Lawton's Quasimodo marked her breakthrough in Hollywood. It was her first major film in 1939 and showcased her beauty and acting prowess to the world. 
her collaboration with John Ford. Maureen had a fruitful professional relationship with the legendary director. The most notable of their collaborations is The Quiet Man. She starred in a series of swashbuckling and adventure films in the 40s and 50s, such as The Black Swan with Tyrone Power and Sinbad the Sailor with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. She showcased her versatility, appearing in westerns and comedies, films like McClintock and Miracle on 34th Street. This film remains one of the most beloved holiday movies of all time. After a hiatus from film, Maureen O'Hara returned to the screen in Only the Lonely in 1991, playing the overbearing mother to John Candy's character. Her performance was acclaimed, showcasing her timeless talent. She was awarded an Honorary Academy Award in 2014. John's Marriages Beyond his alleged relationship with Maureen O'Hara, John Wayne also had three marriages. He married Josephine Sands on June 24, 1933. The marriage lasted about seven years without too many issues. But in 1940, things changed. Josephine discovered John was having an affair with Marlene Dietrich. He was filming a movie with her at the time, and the two began a relationship on set. They got divorced in 1945. Though if John was upset about the divorce, he had a hard time showing it because he married another woman in less than a month. After meeting and falling for a woman named Esperanza Bauer, John married her three weeks after his divorce was finalized. Esperanza went by the nickname Chata, and Wayne and Chata got married at the Unity Presbyterian Church of Long Beach. This was notable because it's the same church where Wayne's mother got remarried. Things between John and Chata went sour pretty steadily. After honeymooning, the pair returned to L.A. and bought a house in Van Nuys, California. On Chata's insistence, they set up an extra bedroom for her mother to live in. This immediately caused issues in their relationship. Reportedly, Wayne grew more and more frustrated with the situation, saying Chata and her mother were constantly speaking only Spanish. He said not only that, but Chata and her mom would commonly take up their marital bed, forcing John to sleep on a living room couch. The two finally divorced in 1954, but Wayne wasted no time in marrying another woman. He met Pilar Paulette and married her in late 54, while the ink on his divorce from Chata was still drying. But reportedly their marriage was a happy one to begin with and didn't suffer from the relatively immediate tumult that his first two marriages had. John was diagnosed with late-stage lung cancer in 1964. Sadly, he had to have his left lung removed as well as four of his ribs. This illness no doubt put a strain on their marriage, but they managed to stick it out through John's illness and subsequent recovery. But by the time the 70s rolled around, the two were having issues. John reacted by devoting more and more time to his work, and by 1973, they were officially separated. Now it's time to hear from you. Did you know that Maureen O'Hara's grandson essentially confirmed the rumors that O'Hara and John Wayne had a romantic relationship? Let us know in the comments section below.